Aloha, and welcome to The Creative Life, an innovative, collaborative production between Think Tech Hawaii and the American Creativity Association. I'm your host, Darlene Boyd, and our guest is joining me from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and our guest is Lynn Krauss. Uh, what we have been attempting to do in The Creative Life is to bring you conversations that talk about the creative process, both in theory and practice, and today is one of those conversations that we'll be dealing with how creativity is applied in a very interesting schemata and uh, also a very fun conversation. So our guest is Lynn Krauss and Lynn is the Chief Innovation Officer for Brain-Based Training and Development. She has her expertise in the area of the brain and uh, some of you have seen her with us before. She had a show on change, but today she's here to talk about a hobby she's had, or more in depth, a passion she has had early since an early time in her life, and that's the Broadway theater. Um, for those of us that um, I grew up on the East Coast in Philadelphia area, not far from where Lynn is living, so we had access to Broadway. wasn't uh, that close, but we could train it or drive it. And uh, for the rest of rest of us, and and especially for me now being relocated, I miss the Broadway experience. It's it's not the easy little pop jump that uh, it was for me. So uh, Lynn and I were talking before the show and, and I was recollecting my first Broadway experience was still while I was in school, but it was Anthony Newley and a production called The Roar of the Grease Paint, The Smell of the Crowd. I think I have that right. And I, I will never forget when that curtain goes up and the orchestra starts that there's literally goosebumps on your arm as, as you just get your first experience. So with that, Lynn, let me turn it to you and tell us how you got into this strong passion. And look at you, look at, yeah. look at everything behind you there. I thought, yeah. yeah, that is a passion. <laughs> yes. Oh, hi, Darlene. Great to uh, be back with you again. Uh, one of the things for me uh, with Broadway, I've been going for more than 50 years uh, to see Broadway. And this is something you probably don't know. I was also involved with two, two friends of mine. We wrote a musical and we tried to get the rights to get it produced. We spent a lot of money, never got the rights because it was so involved. So uh, my, my love of Broadway actually translated to the creative side of actually trying to get something produced. We were trying to make a musical of Pocket Full of Miracles. And the rights issue was just so involved. In took a lot of money and it didn't work out, but we wrote in this musical. <laughs> How long did you work on that? A couple of years, you know, it was in my thirties. So way back when. So, uh, but anyway, so that my uh, love of theater also uh, is personal and that it was also trying to get in on the creative side. And right now I'm also trying to bring it as a, to uh, seniors every uh, twice a month, I do a presentation with seniors. So one of the things we wanted to talk about, this idea about uh, innovating uh, the Broadway experience, and I, and I wanna tie it a little bit to the whole pandemic thing. Okay. What happened with Broadway? If you remember, it had to shut down for almost two years. And during the pandemic, People were thinking, what can we do? We, we miss theater, we want theater. And, uh, you know, there was so much going on in the streaming services. There's many services that already have content of shows that have been recorded live in the theater, both in DVD and the, the streaming services. And since we have so many streaming services now, they all have different ones. And, um, so what happened during COVID, people tried to get even more creative. And uh, for instance, one of the things, Andrew Lloyd Webber released his entire library of recorded shows and he put it up on the internet, everybody to use it, no cost. So they had access to his whole library, Cats, uh, Phantom, uh, Joseph, the, the whole range of his shows were up there. Uh, other people were also putting things up that they allowed uh, a stream of that normally you couldn't see just during the COVID experience. And one of the things I noticed is you had a lot of these 
regional theater companies uh, starting to uh, film their productions and actually stream them. People would buy tickets online and watch the stream because there was no go live to the theater. And so people were selling these products online and you could just, you know, get your ticket and watch it. I watched quite a few of them, you know, while I was in. So what we're talking about today is this whole concept of the live capture of um, theater, especially Broadway theater, and then being presented uh, to the public in various mediums. Now, one of the ways we always saw it, actually, I'll take you back to your childhood. You all saw Peter Pan live. Remember Peter Pan with Mary Martin? Absolutely. NBC, NBC broadcasted that live. Now, that wasn't considered a theater capture because they actually shot that in NBC studio, you know, so that the sets weren't exactly what you were seeing on Broadway, but everybody loved it and they would do it live. They did it live for about three, four years. And then Mary Martin said, you better record it because I'm not doing it again. <laughs> so in 1960, they recorded it. We saw it. But that's an example of where everybody, you know, weren't you applauding at your screen for Tinkerbell? Without so, a doubt. Without right. A doubt. So we, it <laughs> still got you in. It was still theater. So uh, one of the things that's been going on is there's been a lot of capture of theater, mainly with PBS, public broadcast system. They used to have American Playhouse, and then they had great performances. And what they would actually do is they would go in, they would help fund and go in and record uh, something like live at Lincoln Center. Uh, they did a number of shows. Now, because of the union contracts and all, once PBS showed it live, it could never be reshown. It, it, was a, it was negotiated as a one-time live performance. So they did, uh, they did a number of them. Uh, the revival of South Pacific was done. Um, Light in the Piazza was done. Um, Into the Woods was done. There was a number of shows over the years that we all would watch on PBS and you could see it that one time. Now, what's happened because of funding, because of expenses, PBS, all the, all the musicals they've been showing uh, recently are the ones that were actually filmed live in the theater. They were mainly, they were all, all the ones they've been showing were filmed over in England. Why? Because of cost. So like if we, uh, like when a show, like example would be Memphis was a, a Tony winning uh, best musical. It was filmed live in the theater and then put out to the movie theaters for people to see. That cost $3 million to film. Why? Because you had all the unions. You had the actors union, the musicians union. You had a ton of unions. So did they ever recoup it? No, they never recouped their $3 million. Now, a show that was on PBS that, they, that was filmed over in England, American in Paris, the musical, it was, again, won the Tony for the uh, best musical. The entire American cast went over to London and they was playing over there and the companies over there filmed it. Now, what was the difference? The cost over there uh, to film American in Paris would have been $950,000. So it's under a million mm -hmm. versus over here, three million. So that's why what happens is all our American cast are going over there and then they film them. And PBS, everything they've been showing on PBS are all of these um, ones that were filmed in London. Some of them released. One of the things we've had in the last, I'm not going to get, I want to say about 10 years, there's something called Phantom Events which is they will show retrospects of older uh, movies or whatever, but they show all these um, taped um, Broadway shows or plays. I've also seen plays and they show them in the theaters all across the United States and in other countries. And when it's a phantom event, you're basically paying like $20 to see it, but they have an unbelievable amount of people who attend this more than who would ever see a show 
no matter how long it was on Broadway or how long it ran. And so the- uh, Are Phantom, are, are Phantom yeah. events in the theater? Is that a one night? Yes, well, they announce a date. Usually it's one or two dates. So a, a, a good example would be Disney had a show called Newsies. Uh, I saw it when it was being getting ready for Broadway. So I didn't actually see the final version of it. And what happened is Disney, because Disney owned the product. So you're already talking less money because they own everything. You know, it's their, it was their rights to everything. So it, it was a lot different. You weren't having to pay all these different people. And so Disney uh, filmed Newsies in the theater and they released it as a Phantom event and it broke all records. It broke some previous records. It was released four times because it was so popular. And then it was on Netflix for a while, but when Disney Plus came on as a streaming service, Disney uh, took it back off of, Net off of Netflix uh, onto Disney Plus. Are these but, phantom events in major cities? Yes, they're all over. You go on, you key in your, um, zip code and it tells you where like let's say in an area like philadelphia and surrounding areas it may be in five six theaters it, if you go to places that aren't as populated maybe one so they pick certain uh venues and to give you an example of how many people we're talking about after three showings of newsy over two hundred thousand people saw that now think about paying twenty dollars now, here's the most interesting thing. When they went to see who actually were the audiences who were going, it was a mix of people who loved Newsies. I myself had seen the show. I went to see it as a Phantom event. And there were people who were going to see it again. And then there were people who never heard of it, but they thought it sounded kind of interesting. So that's what happens when these shows go out. Um, it, when they're released in as a phantom event. And then there was another company that was actually doing it in the movie theater. Now, one other show I want to talk about, because it's, I think, in terms of creativity and its historical perspectiveness, George Takai, who you would know from Star Trek fame, he wrote a show called Allegiance, and it was based on his childhood, his real childhood. He was one of the um, uh, Japanese Americans who were interred during World War II. So he created this show and it, about that whole experience. It was a great musical. I saw it on Broadway. I thought it was fabulous. Of course, the critics weren't too nice to it. And so it didn't last very long. It maybe ran seven months. But what George Takai did, he, just, he made an agreement. He did this. He filmed it in the theater right before it closed. And he put it out as a phantom event. It was in 600 um, cities all over. And he held the original record for selling out every single theater. It was a Newsies broke it. but And then it was such a success, he released it again. And when did he release it? He, re he released it on uh, the 75th anniversary when that executive order to inter the Japanese Americans was given. And then he released it yet again on Pearl Harbor Day. And he released it a fourth time. So here's a show that was really important that no one would have seen. Otherwise. Yeah. Right, and he created an educational kit and made it available because now that was filmed, but it was filmed right in the theater with an audience. And so it was like being there, you know, when you experience these shows because the audiences are there. And it's, it's like being in theater. Now, does anything replace live theater? No, we all love no. live theater. But let's face it. I don't know if our viewers out there have been to Broadway and saw the cost of tickets recently. I mean, you're talking, you have to pay anywhere from 300 and some dollars to 100, you know. I was and, going to ask you, that was one of my questions, what, right. what's the running cost right now? Yes, because what happened, I want to say, now I'm, I may be getting this wrong. I want to say it was back, I don't know, maybe it's 10 years now, maybe I'm off some years. The theater started this concept called premium seating. They didn't like that when a show was a big hit, 
the uh, scalpers would sell tickets for so much, so they created their own system. So, but what happened initially, it was maybe 12 rows in the center orchestra that the seats were $300. Now, you'd say, who would do that? Okay, well, oh, I will go back. When, if, uh, when Miss Saigon opened, and that was about 28 years ago, there was premium seating for Miss Saigon. And the premium seating back then was like $199. And I'm one of these people who paid because I wanted to be in the theater to see um, that show. And it was, you know, so did I pay? Yes. Now the premium seating is like three, 325, depends on the show. But the thing is initially they would take like middle of the first two rows of the mezzanine and maybe 12 rows in the orchestra. Not now, they go back maybe 13, 14 rows and they go in the, the four seats on each side. So if you really want a great seat, you're paying premium. Who can afford premium? Mm -hmm. And <laughs> I, really, you can't. And so what happens is you end up being on the side if you want to be close or further back because you don't want to, because you can get like, let's say then the, what theater's done now is they have about five or six different prices with depending on where you're sitting. but basically theater is out of range for many people. If you're a student, a lot of the New York shows, you know, give the student tickets and they have the rush and certain shows like Hamilton will do the lottery, you know, where you can get the first two rows. But basically it's really expensive for people. And even a touring company that will come, let's say where you live or where I live in Philly, you're still talking a hundred and some dollars for a ticket. And mm -hmm. so it becomes really prohibitive. So the idea that they now are, can go in they, with now, especially nowadays with the better sound systems, high definition, and they film the show over a number of days. So you're really, you're seeing the show in the best possible way. And you're going, oh, I could pay $20 and see it in the theater. And now with streaming services, we can see them right from our very home. So uh, when ha if you remember when Disney Plus brought Hamilton out, they paid $80 million for Hamilton. Hamilton was filmed. It was supposed to be released. It was filmed on the stage. It was supposed to be released to the movie theaters. And what happened is COVID hit. And they didn't want to sit and hold it for two years or whatever. So they sold Disney Plus bought it and showed it. Now, I, people were very worried. The producer said, if we allow people, if we, you know, uh, capture our shows and then show it, who's going to come to the theater? That was their thought. The, last week's Broadway grosses, Hamilton was the second highest grossing show. It's been on Disney Plus with the original cast recorded in the theater for at least a year and a half. And yet on Broadway, it was the second highest grossing show. And how long has Hamilton been running? Oh God, let's see. Oh my God, see, I don't even know. Let me see, Hamilton, I would say, I'm gonna guess like six years, maybe, maybe more. Uh, I saw it when it first moved up, but this is an interesting thing. People were so convinced that if people could see the productions filmed in the theater, they wouldn't go. And there's no correlation to that. Memphis was recorded while the show was still running and it had won Best Musical. And they originally did it because it didn't get the greatest reviews when it first opened. And they thought this would be a way to get interest if they were gonna do a touring company. And so what they ended up doing is it was in the movie theaters. It was still running on Broadway. And, uh, but again, because I told you about the cost, they never made the money back. Uh, some other shows, just because of COVID, to give you an example, Diana the Musical was scheduled to open in Broadway last November, okay? And so uh, they were just going into preview and COVID shut everything down. So the producer was worried that it would disrupt everything so much that he'd never make the money back. They wouldn't make the money back. So they made a deal with Netflix. They filmed Diana the Musical. There wasn't an audience. This was one time, it was filmed on stage, but there was no audience because no one was allowed to, 
go in the theaters. So they sold it to Netflix. So he probably recouped the cost of his musical. But unfortunately, the interesting thing was it premiered on Netflix two weeks before it opened on Broadway when, it, when, when COVID you know, let Broadway reopen. So mm -hmm. when it was on Netflix, every, the critics trashed it. And then when poor Diana opened on Broadway, they trashed that too. But mm -hmm. I, I didn't think it was, I, did I think it was great? No, but I found it very enjoyable watching it. it. Yeah, I didn't have to pay $199. So I said, <laughs> okay, yeah, it was very enjoyable. And so uh, a lot of that was, uh, you know, that that was a, an interesting thing that they were able to recoup it, even though uh, it didn't work. Now, an example of where it did work, Cameron McIntosh uh, was bringing the 25th anniversary production of Miss Saigon into New York. And it was 25 years later. And um, it, it was like the cast, he brought the London cast over and it got rave, 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 everybody. So it was going to open in Broadway in March, in a March as it. Well, meanwhile, he decided he filmed it live in the theater in London. He released it to Phantom Events on two different uh, dates before, right before the New York opening. And I was thinking, wow, why are you doing that? I was like, I, so I saw it in the theater. I wasn't in New York at the time. So I got to see the production, but it was a limited run in New York, which they knew was going to pretty much sell out anyway. But there is an example of he wanted to hype it all up. And later it was shown on PBS, that version. You could have, people could have seen it on PBS. And so um, that's an example of it. The show was ready to open and it didn't hurt the box office in the least. So the, the producers have changed their mind. The problem is the cost if you film in here in the United States. So I want one of the uh, places that probably for any of our viewers who would love to see all these shows, there's a service called Broadway HD. I subscribe to it. I was one of the original subscribers, but they have so much content now. They have basically all of national theater from one, you know, from England, all their Shakespeare plays filmed live in the theater. Uh, they have almost all the, any Broadway show that's been on Phantom Events, they have. So they started out by their idea was they wanted to lease as much content as they could. They also tried to do something that was started back in 2000. And in 2000, there was a company came about called the Broadway Television Network. They had this idea, we're going to film four shows and broadcast them live from the theater because we didn't have streaming services then. You had pay-per-view, okay? There was no, you know, you had cable and then they had this pay-per-view, you would pay for extra kind of events. And so they were going to do four shows. They actually did three and they went under. Why? Because they did the first, and this is considered the first show ever streamed live from the theater. And it was Sophisticated Ladies. It was a great show. It was a, a Duke Ellington review. It didn't have all the original cast because they didn't want to do it. They had to bring in the touring company because uh, they were arguing about money. So, and other things. So, but it was a great production. It went live from the theater. And here's the problem. Back then, pay-per-view across our country had about... Uh, 613,000 subscribers, approximately. Because remember, cable was new back then. People didn't want to pay for television, True. you know? And so what happened is when they put it out on pay-per-view, they were charging $15. Well, they only had about 10% of their audience sign up for it, which is about 6,200 people. And so they they made less than a million dollars, but it cost two million to do because again, this company spent years negotiating with the unions, four years over that um, uh, these four shows they were going to do, and they did Forever Plaid, and they did Jekyll and Hyde was like. So there's um, I I don't want 
Thank you. To, to miss this opportunity. You you have an exciting mm -hmm. situation that you've fallen into and you've really developed it. And that is the work that you do at a home for seniors. So yes. tell us a little bit about that. We just have a few yeah. minutes left. Oh, but. oh, I didn't realize. See, we went so quick. Okay. So basically, there's so much to talk about. I know. So basically, uh, twice a month, we show a Broadway show there, and the, the um, place subscribes to Broadway HD and all. So I've showed them a range of shows. They imagine the seniors, they all saw Hamilton and loved it. And, you know, we, I show them, you know, their, the shows, the Rogers and Hammerstein shows and their shows. So they love it, and they ask uh, excellent questions. And, this, and of course, we run closed caption. And I did just want to mention for our viewers out there, if you're looking for the best source for this stuff, it's Broadway HD. I think, I forget how much the yearly thing is, but they have made, I'm saying hundreds and hundreds uh, of content. That, uh, so so in, in this senior home that, that yeah. you're having this great yeah. experience. As we should. Yeah. So, to, so what's the age range for example oh, okay you the younger i would say the, yes the youngest person is probably in their 70s and they go up to my aunt who's there she's 96 and so i was curious because you know one of the things about hamilton is the speed at which they're saying right. the words it's right. it's faster than sometimes the ear can really hear which is why we ran the closed caption we do it on all the shows but they liked it. They didn't love it, but they liked it. But what a and, great experience for them, because I suppose they, there's no, there's yes. not a possibility for them to get to Broadway on a regular. Yes, and I think that's true about a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's, you that's, know, that's and I will just say this: uh, one of the things I say to them, and I'll say to everybody out here, it's so great to experience stuff, shows that you think you would hate or not like that you can go and see them and whether you're looking at a streaming service you already had or one of the others or search at YouTube, uh, but try to search the, um, the real stuff, not somebody who kind of illegally filmed it in the theater. It's not the same. And the thing is, you're not paying $199. So it's right. a great, I mean, there's nothing worse than paying all this money, going to see a show, and you go, oh, it was God, that was horrible. Yeah. And, you know, plus all your travel. So I think- so you can dabble in a few opportunities and really right. be pleasantly surprised. And right, and, a great find sh and find shows you would never like. And I found with our group here, they loved Kinky Boots, which I wasn't sure they would like. And <laughs> they loved it. And, uh, uh, you know, shows that you think, like I showed them- uh, um, Oklahoma with Hugh Jackman, there was a, there's a version that was filmed in the National Theater there, and it's three hours. And they just felt it was, believe it or not, Oklahoma, they thought it was kind of too long. And that <laughs> would have been their show. So very interesting. But yet other shows, like when we did King and I, that was, they didn't care about the three hours there. So it's, it's interesting to uh, see the response. But I think the greatest thing is for don't forget about theater and in our new environment you have access because um you're going to see it more and more because you'll be able to you don't want to go to theater but you'll you can do it online i think pretty soon this is a lynn lynn uh prediction All right. uh, it won't be long before the actually i believe the currently running shows on broadway We'll figure out, they'll have a day where they'll go and do a live stream. You'll go and buy tickets that they'll actually sell to the individual. That's what I think we'll get to because uh, cost is so prohibitive for people and it, it so limits who can see live theater. Well, even though all your examples make the theater accessible to those that can't, um, <clears throat> you still won't see the chandelier and phantom come crashing down above your head. Or the well, helicopter from Miss Saigon. Oh, right. Well, you see it, it you are, you do see it. You're right. Just, if you you're not there. I mean, yeah. mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. You won't well, think well, about it. You're, yes, I'll say what if you're sitting in the balcony of Phantom, it's not coming over your head. True, you're right. true. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> well, Lynn, thank you. This has been this has been uh, our pleasure to hear and hear about all these opportunities and uh, take us back, those of us that have been to the theater, bring us back to some memories. 
and uh, I hope we can do this again. And yes. with that, I, I thank you and I thank your, our viewers for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you again in two weeks. And until then, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.